in John chapter 10, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, John chapter 10, there is an old Sherlock Holmes story called The Adventure of the Musgrave Ritual. How many of you have read that story or are familiar with it? Three of you, awesome. So there is an old British family in this story that's living out on this historic old estate that notices that their butler starts acting very strangely one day, and then one night he just disappears. With the help of Sherlock Holmes, they discover that he's been following this treasure map and they're able to retrace his steps to an old forgotten cellar in an abandoned wing of this old house. There they find the the butler's body stretched out over a box of what looks like a worthless pile of debris. This is the woodcut from the original story. Um, That's uh, the the picture from the book. The, uh, The pile that they discover looks like it's nothing. It's got four or five old coins in it, which, yeah, they've got a little bit of value, but certainly nothing that looks like it's worth dying for. The mystery of the story is how did the butler die and what was he really after? Eventually, Sherlock Holmes notices that in this pile of debris is an old twisted circular piece of metal that nobody's paid any attention to. But Holmes is curious about it, so he starts to rub one of the corners of this piece of metal and it starts to glow like a spark. Turns out to be a diamond. And Holmes eventually realizes that this relic is the ancient lost crown of the kings of England. That's what the butler had died trying to acquire, but nobody else had eyes to see the treasure. All they saw was a worthless pile of debris. You say, well, pastor, great. Now you've spoiled that story for me if I choose to go home and read it today. Y'all listen, that story has been out since 1893, okay? Do not tell me you were planning to go home this afternoon and read it. I'm just not feeling bad about that. There is a paradox at the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel has a paradox, and that is what looks to others like nothing more than a twisted pile of debris, God sees as a treasure of such value that he is willing to lay down his life for it. The irony is that he sees more than anybody just how messed up we actually are, and yet, and yet he's also the one who loves us more than anybody else ever has, and that fact That fact, the fact that he sees us most clearly and yet loves us most deeply, that he's going to explain in John 10, that is one of the ways that we know or can know that he is the true savior. In this passage of scripture we're gonna look at today, you're gonna see how Jesus's leadership stands out, stands apart from every other religious leader in history and how his his authority, his leadership answers one of the deepest soul yearnings that we have. Jesus's claim in John 10 is very simply this. I am the good shepherd. You see, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the fifth of our I am statements from the gospel of John. The fifth of seven times that Jesus takes for himself the loftiest name of God in the Old Testament. I am, or or Yahweh in Hebrew, Jehovah in the Latin translation of that. And then Jesus connects that lofty name of God to one of our greatest points of brokenness. So to those who were hungry, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. To those who feel like they're in darkness, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. To those in need of shelter or refuge, Jesus says, I am the door. To those feeling the sting of death or or confused by where God's love is in the middle of it, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Today, we're gonna come to what might be the most famous of all of those I am claims. To those who feel isolated or abandoned or alone, Jesus says, John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He, you see, who is a hired hand and not really the true shepherd, who does not own the sheep, yeah, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and actually cares nothing for the sheep personally. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. These verses are a continuation of the discussion Jesus started with the Pharisees in which he explained that he was the one door for the sheep. We looked at that passage a couple weeks ago. It's the first few verses there in chapter 10. And you might remember that. In that discussion, Jesus was contrasting his leadership, you might recall, with that of the Pharisees. Jesus had just forgiven this adulterous woman that the Pharisees were ready to stone, and he's just healed a blind man that the Pharisees despised. 
And so to the Pharisees, Jesus says, the true shepherd, the true shepherd sees value where other people only see junk. In these verses, Jesus is picking up on a a famous passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, where around 600 BC, God had condemned the worthless shepherds of Israel. One of my people's problems, God had said through Ezekiel, is that their leaders are corrupt. And then God, through Ezekiel, lists out 10 different complaints about Israel's political and religious leaders that all center around the same thing. You don't love the sheep. You use the sheep. You don't feed the sheep. You use them to feed yourselves. You don't shield and protect the sheep. You shear the sheep to profit yourself. You don't bind up the wounded or go out searching for the lost. You abandon the sheep the moment that they become an inconvenience for you. You worthless shepherds, he says, you treat the sheep like they are little more than an asset to your personal fortunes. Sadly, by the way, that description would still apply to a lot of Christian leaders today. And I know, by the way, that some of you have suffered under that kind of leadership. If that is you, I just wanna say that I recognize how difficult it can be for you to even come back to a place like this and sit here this morning. You being here right now, we do not take that lightly. I know it is a huge step for you. But all of our leaders here want to model the kind of sacrificial leadership that Jesus is about to commend here. Because Jesus's leadership, you see, is different from those worthless kinds of shepherds that God is lamenting in Ezekiel. Shai Lin, who is a Christian hip hop artist, says that Jesus presents his leadership in John 10, verses 10 through 14, in direct contrast to the corrupt shepherds of Ezekiel 34. He is most likely thinking about this passage when he gives us that description in John 10. In contrast to their authority, Shai Lin says, Jesus's authority is a, number one, protective authority. Number two, it is a loving authority. Number three, it is a sacrificial authority. I'm gonna use Shai Lin's list, but expand it slightly. And I'm gonna make everything in the list start with the letter P because I'm a Baptist and that's just what we do, okay? I'm gonna show you that Jesus' leadership in these verses, in contrast to that of the Pharisees and other false shepherds, is protective, personal, prospering, and propitiatory. And that is how you know Jesus is the true shepherd. It's also how you know I'm a Southern Baptist because I did that right there at the P's, okay? Before we unpack each of those words, let me be very clear with you, okay? Jesus claims to be an authority. He never minces words about that. Our culture does not like authority, so we would rather recast Jesus as a moral model we aspire to, or a life coach, or the ultimate TikTok religious influencer. We wish Jesus' I am claim was something like, I am the ultimate algorithm who will populate your feed with wonderful spiritual options for you to choose from. But the central Christian confession is not that Jesus is insightful or helpful or cool, but that Jesus is Lord. And Lord means that whatever Jesus says on anything at any time in any place becomes your new rule if you're gonna be his follower. Jesus once said to a group of would-be followers, Luke 6, 46, why would you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do the things that I say? Why would you call me Lord if you're still your own Lord? Even if you've given Jesus 95% control of your life, aren't you still really the Lord of your whole life since you get to decide what 95% he gets and what 5% you keep? Unless he's Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Jesus might say that to many of us today, by the way. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not believe what I say about this or that area of your life? Why would you call me Lord and not give me control over this area? See, unless you've submitted yourself fully to Jesus, making him the complete and unchallenged Lord of your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, he's not your Lord. So yes, Jesus is an authority. But Jesus' authority is different from almost every other authority you've experienced, certainly certainly from any toxic, abusive, self-serving authority that you've suffered under. And that, Jesus explains, is one of the ways that we know that he's the true shepherd. First, Jesus' authority is protective. Protective. Verse 11 again, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. By contrast, verse 12, the one who's a hired hand and not really the shepherd, who doesn't know the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The true shepherd loves his sheep and is committed to protecting the sheep up to the point of dying for them. I've explained this before, but y'all, it's hard to think of a less flattering analogy that Jesus could have come up with for us than, than sheep. A sheep without a shepherd in the wild is called a meal. 
Sheep are slow and they are clumsy and they are dumb. They are not great fighters. All due respect to Ramesses, the UNC mascot, but typically sheep are not threatening animals. If sheep trip on a rock and they fall over casts on their back, they stay there like a beetle until somebody comes along and flips them back over. That is not a good quality to carry with you into a fight, right? Imagine an MMA fighter who, when he got flipped onto his back, couldn't stand up until somebody flipped him back over. That guy's not gonna make it very far. By the way, I heard a missionary to Muslims um, over in the rural Middle East where shepherding's still a thing say that, that, that when he explained Jesus's parable about the sheep and the goats to a Muslim friend there, that parable where at the end of time, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats and takes only the sheep, the Muslim shepherd objected and said, that can't be right. A true shepherd would never take sheep over goats. Sheep are so time intensive. Goats, by contrast, they take care of themselves. Every shepherd prefers goats over sheep. Well, yeah, the missionary explained, but God wants sheep, not goats, because he wants us to depend on him. Not because he is controlling or domineering, but because he knows how weak we are and he loves us. His love is a protective love. A few weeks ago, I showed you this picture of an ancient sheep pen, and I explained to you how this, this, this shepherd slept in this little doorway right here to keep out predators. Literally, the shepherd was the door. And I asked you how your disposition would change if you believed that nothing came into that pen without the permission of the shepherd. I, I gave you this promise, Psalm 84, 11, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly before him. That doesn't mean, I told you, that doesn't mean that nothing bad or painful ever happens to the Christian. It just means that I know it comes into the pen only by permission of the shepherd and with the promise that he is gonna use it for good. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly before him. Y'all, that means if God withholds it from me, it isn't really good. And if he allows it, he plans to use it for good, even if it's painful. So again, how would your perspective in life change if you actually believe that? That nothing came into your life that God did not intend to use for good. Again, I don't mean that he caused it or that he's the one who did it, just that he promises to use it for good. Think about the worst thing that's happened to you this week. How would your perspective, your attitude change if you said, God, thank you for the pain of and you fill in the blank. Because I know you, my shepherd, who lies at the gate of my life, allowed this thing, this painful thing, and you plan to use it for good. In Psalm 23, David, who began his life as a shepherd, revels in the protection of his shepherd. It's one of the most well-known scripture passages in the world. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this, but it's actually all about protection. In fact, I saw one commentator describe the protections promised in Psalm 23 like, like this. The Lord is my shepherd. That is protection beside me. He leads me um, in green pastures. That's protection beneath me. Beside still waters, that's near me. Um, he uh, uh, leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. That's ahead of me. He restores my soul. That's protection within me. He prepares a table before me. That's protection around me in the presence of my enemies. That's protection against those who are against me. Um, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. That's protection for me. His oil is upon my head. That's protection upon me. My cup overflows. That's protection above me me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. That's protection behind me. And I will dwell in the house of the father forever and ever. That is protection before me. There, I'm literally surrounded by protection. It means there is nowhere or no thing that is exempt from his sovereign care. Nothing. You literally can't get anywhere. How would your perspective change if you actually believe that? Psalm 139, David exalts, where could I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence if I ascended to heaven? Of course, you're there. That's where you live. But if I made my bed in Sheol, the Old Testament word for hell, you'd still be there. If I took the wings of the morning and dwelt in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your right hand, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. David said, I literally cannot get away from your love. Even if I made my bed in hell, God, you wouldn't leave me there. Truth is, of course, we did make our bed in hell. We rejected God and ran as far as we possibly could from him. And yet, even there, he still kept his promise to protect us. He entered hell and took it in our place. It's no wonder David says in the next verse, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could number them, they would outnumber the sand of the seashore. Y'all, that number of grains of sand on the seashore is eight quintillions or eight with 18 zeros after it. Look, number looks like this right here. 
That's the amount of times that God has thought about you individually and your protection. Pick up a handful of sand next time you're at the beach. Let it run through your fingers. Look at each grain and think, God thought about me individually there and there and there and there. And then look down the beach and think each of those grains of sand represent a thought about me. Y'all, I cannot even get my mind around that. Do you ache to be special to someone? You're special to God. You yearn in the depths of your soul to matter to somebody. You matter to God. Do you know how much and how often he thinks about you? My goodness. God's thoughts about you outnumber the sands of the seashore. I can assure you, nothing gets into that pen without his awareness and his promise. You may think it's random or unfortunate or bad luck. And again, I'm not saying God's the one doing it to you. I'm just saying that, that whatever it is comes with his promise to use it for good because you have a savior who neither slumbers nor sleeps, who always stands guard at the gate of your life. The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> Amen and hallelujah, which leads me to the second characteristic of his authority. It's personal. It's personal. Verse 14, Jesus says, I know my sheep. My sheep know me. I call them each out by name. Jesus' sheep are not one big formless mass to him. He knows each of them by name, Fluffy, Snowball, Wooly, Rufus, Bernadette, whatever you'd name sheep, I don't know. There's a Scottish pastor named Douglas McMillan. He died when I was in high school, but he worked as a shepherd in Scotland before becoming a pastor. And he tells a story about one day, he, he said he was on a train with a shepherd friend who three weeks prior had sold a number of his lambs to another farmer, another shepherd. As the train was pulling out of the station, they passed a flock of sheep in a pen that was, you know, a dozen yards or so from the, from the railroad track. And the shepherd looked up and said, hey, there's four of my lambs in there. He knew his sheep so well he could spot four lambs out of a flock from a moving train. Honestly, I, I'm not sure I could, I could spot my kids from a moving train. <laughs> I mean, just kidding. But that's how well a good shepherd knows his sheep. There's an individuality to God's love that the Holy Spirit enables you to feel. It's not just that God so loved the world, as in God has a generic kindly disposition to the world, but God loves me. Paul says in Romans, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. He sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts individually, teaching us to say, Abba, Father, or my daddy. I think of my kids, especially when they were young, when they called me daddy, it was a deeply personal name. They knew I was paying attention to them in crowds more than I was anybody else. And sometimes, by the way, God even goes the extra mile in communicating that to us. I once heard a, a pastor tell a, a story about how one night he was putting his 10 year old daughter to bed. And as he tucked his girl in, he was just singing over her that little, you know, that song, You Are My Sunshine, My Only Sunshine. Well, when he got back to his room, his wife was crying. And so he asked her what was wrong. And she said, she said, I just listened to you. My daddy never sang over me like that. And I'm watching you raise our girls. And, and I, I just, I, I rejoice in that. And I know I'm supposed to be happy about it. And I am, but I just, I just, I never had a dad like that. And I know I'm never going to. And she said, I'm grateful for all that God has given me. I'm grateful for you as a husband. It just feels like there's these gaps in my heart that I'm never going to be able to fill. Pastor said, I, I tried to comfort her, but I just couldn't. This was an old, deep wound that my, my love for her wasn't gonna be able to fix. Well, life moved on and they forgot about it. A few weeks go by and the pastor said one of his pastor friends came to speak at their church's staff meeting. At the end, they just opened up the altar for prayer the way we do sometimes. And this pastor and his wife came up to pray specifically. They were coming up to pray about a financial issue they were facing. Their coming forward had nothing to do with this moment she'd had a few weeks before. Well, their pastor friend came over and laid his hands on them and started to pray for them. And then after a few sentences of the prayer, he stopped and said, he said, y'all, I think God is putting something on my heart that he wants to say to you, but honestly, it's really unusual and it's strange and I can't really sing, so I'm just gonna say it. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Pastor said, my wife and I just came apart. We had not told anybody about that moment and we knew our heavenly father was speaking right to us. His love is a personal love. 
By the way, maybe you hear that story and you say, oh, I wish God would do something like that for me. He might. But listen, this is important. It's not just in those divine butterfly moments that you perceive his love. That's not even the main way. Paul says the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts by allowing us to perceive the gospel. He lets us see the gospel is for us. It's John Wesley talking about his heart being strangely warmed at that meeting in Aldersgate Chapel where he realizes that Jesus had not just died for the sins of the whole world, but his sins, even his You see, the truth is, if you perceive and you believe the truth of the gospel, that is evidence of God's love at work inside of you. Remember, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, that nobody can even say Jesus is Lord truly, except by the Holy Spirit, which means that if you are able to recognize this morning from your heart that Jesus is Lord, that is evidence of his love at work in you. And so through that confession right now, he's saying to you, I love you. When I died on the cross, I was thinking about you. I paid for your sin. I heard a true story about a guy named Steve Henning, who when he was two years old, contracted spinal meningitis and completely lost his hearing. For the next 58 years, Steve lived in complete silence. He never heard the sound of music, laughter, the voice of his loved ones, nothing. Well, in the winter of 2001, his doctor told him about a new surgical procedure that could could implant a sound wave detection device that could bypass the non-functioning part of his ear that had been destroyed by the meningitis, and it could transmit the audio signals directly to his auditory nerve. But here was the thing. After they implanted the device back near his brain, because of how close it was, they could not activate it until the swelling from the surgery had gone down, and that would take at least six weeks. So Steve had to wait for six weeks to see if the surgery worked. Well, finally, the day arrived and the audiologist programmed the the cochlear implant on his device and he held his finger over the final key and nodded to Steve as if to ask him if he was ready. Steve gave the thumbs up and the doctor hit enter. And then the doctor motioned to Steve's wife to say something and she leaned toward her husband and she just gently said, I love you. Steve's face suddenly burst into a smile. The first sound he'd heard in six decades were words of personal love. When God opens your spiritual ears, what you hear is the voice of God whispering in the gospel, I love you. His love is a personal love. Y'all, before I go on to number three, could I just stop and reflect with you for a moment that this is what your soul most craves? You were created to be known and loved by God. We've seen that every week in this series. And what that means is that you're always gonna feel like you're missing something until you're known by him and cherished by him. You know, one of the most popular myths at work in our culture today, and it looks so lovely from the outside, but it's this idea, it's a satanic lie. It's this idea that the only love, the only validation that I need is my own. We don't need anybody else to believe in us as long as we believe in us. I mean, it's like the great Whitney Houston song from the 1980s, the greatest love of all is easy to achieve learning to love yourself. That's the greatest love of all. Or more recently, the Barbie movie. You gotta learn that whoever you are or whatever you are, you are Kenneth. And if you believe that about yourself, you'll have Kennergy or whatever, however they said it. And y'all listen, I agree. It is important not to live or die by the opinion of others. But think with me for a moment, is that really enough? Imagine a songwriter who's been songwriting for 10 years. He's let a few thousand people hear his songs and everybody hates him. They're like, these are terrible. You can't sing these songs. But the songwriter says, well, it doesn't matter what other people think. I know in my heart, I'm a great songwriter. We might sort of admire his self-confidence, but probably we're gonna think he's on the verge of insanity. He's delusional. Now listen, here's the truth. You cannot fully validate yourself. I'm sorry, but you can't. No offense to Whitney Houston or Barbie, but we yearn for a validation that comes from outside of us. We yearn for validation from somebody that we care about. We need somebody outside of us to tell us that we're beautiful, that we're valuable. Well, see, that leaves us with a dilemma, right? We can't fully give that kind of validation to ourselves, but other people are not a reliable source of it. So where do we find it? From our shepherd. You were created to find your identity in him. 
Only your shepherd can name you and bless you. And he does. Jesus said, the good shepherd calls you by name. Again, David reveling in this in Psalm 139 says, before I was fully formed in the womb, God already knew me. When I was a small lump called a fetus with no rights at all in the state of California, God knew me as a person. And God laid out a special plan for me and fashioned me for that plan. Friend, that is true for you also. He created you special. He knows the plans he has for you to prosper you to give you a future and a hope. He's prepared good works for you to go and walk in them. You are his if you are ready to believe that. His leadership is protective. It's personal. Number three, it is prospering. In verse 10, right before Jesus makes the claim to be the good shepherd, he says this, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy, but I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I told you a few weeks ago that the Greek word there for abundantly is the word parisos. It means literally over the top. Jesus promises an abundant, over the top life for his sheep. That does not mean I told you a problem free life or a life necessarily filled with riches and popularity. No, this kind of abundance is better than those things. It's the abundance that comes from walking with one whose love, you know, is stronger than death and resting in the blessed assurance that you are his and he is yours and that he's working all things in your life together for good. That's the abundant life. That's the over the top life. That's the peace that passes all understanding life. He promises to guide you into his pathways of blessing. Listen to this. This is for somebody. Even when you're too dumb to figure out how to get there yourself, which as a sheep you are. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's just true. Can I get you to do a thought experiment with me for a minute? Think with me. For those of you over 30, how do you feel about your wisdom, say, 15 years ago? You look back with amazement at how wise you were back then. Yo, I look back at 35-year-old JD, and I'm like, 35-year-old JD, that guy was an idiot. I mean, I started preaching here when I was 28, but there's a reason you cannot find any sermons online for those first seven years. I'm not sure what was wrong with that guy. I'm kind of embarrassed by him, to be frank. God graciously used me, but man, I look back on that guy, and I'm like, what an idiot. But here was the thing, 35-year-old JD thought he was pretty wise. He felt pretty confident. But if you'd asked 35-year-old JD about 15-year-old JD, he would have said, now that guy was an idiot. But here's the thing, 15-year-old JD was pretty impressed with himself too. So follow this, 15-year-old JD was impressed with himself, but 35-year-old JD was embarrassed by him. Now 50-year-old JD is embarrassed to 35-year-old JD. So here's the obvious question. What do you think 65-year-old JD is gonna think about 50-year-old JD? He's probably gonna think, what an idiot. <laughs> how about heavenly JD? How will heavenly JD feel about earthly JD? I'm guessing he's gonna say, what an idiot. Hey, you don't have to be so enthusiastic about it, okay? I, I get it. Here's the point. Just a little bit of time and space, a little bit of time and space in our lives shows us there's so much more about life that we don't know. Doesn't that mean that at every stage of our lives, we should show a little bit of humility and look to our all-wise shepherd to guide us? You see, the fact that the analogy that God chose for us with sheep is bad news, but the bad news has some good news in it too. The good news is that sheep with a good shepherd turn out fine, and we got a great shepherd. And that means I can trust him to guide me even when I feel incompetent, which if I were really wise, would be pretty much all the time. My confidence in life at 35 or 50 or whenever is not in my ability to figure out God's will. I'm still a sheep and sheep are idiots. My confidence is in God's ability to lead me in his will. In fact, let me slow that down and say it again for you guys in the back because I feel like some of you don't get this. And if you did get this, it would set you free. My confidence in life is not in my ability to figure out God's will. My confidence is in his ability to lead me in it. That's a huge difference between those two. Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't say my clever foxes figure it out and do just fine. He says, my dumb sheep hear my voice and I lead them. I've told you, when I face a difficult decision, I often pray what I call the sheep prayer. It goes like this. God, you called me a sheep. That was your analogy, not mine. Sheep are idiots, which means you know that I don't have the ability to choose the right way here. I'm probably gonna get this wrong. So I need you to close doors that need to be closed. I need you to open ones that need to be open. Yeah, I'm asking you to give me wisdom, but where I mess it up, which I probably will, 
Will you use your rod and staff you talked about in Psalm 23? Will you use those to guide me into the path you want me to go? And then I make the decision that's in front of me. I make it, I make it in confidence that God is keeping his promise. And I'm at peace because I trust in him. I'm not even that confident, y'all, in my ability to hear his voice. Some of you are like, man, I'd love to have God lead me, but I don't even know how to hear his voice. What does that feel like? What does this voice in my soul sound like? I'm so sinful, I don't know how to discern his voice. Hey, you are right, and you probably don't know the half of it. You are so much more sinful and dull of hearing than you could possibly imagine. If you saw how spiritually inept you really are, you probably wouldn't even get out of bed in the morning. But good news, God is your shepherd and he is committed to guide you, which means he will find a way to steer you even when you don't know how to discern his voice, if you trust him. Listen, my sheep prayer, try it, patent pending. You can try it though, for free. Lord, I'm a sheep, which means I'm gonna get it wrong. I trust you to guide me. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. All right, last one. His authority is protective, it's personal, it's prospering, it's propitiatory. I know you've used that word at least three times already today. But I want you to think sacrificial here. Think sacrificial. Five times in John 10, Jesus says he lays down his life for his sheep. That would have seemed crazy even then. Shepherds are way more valuable than sheep. I remember one of my favorite Clint Eastwood movies that came out when I was in college. It's called In the Line of Fire. It's about a special secret service agent that takes a bullet for the president and we admire that, but has there ever been a president who took a bullet for his agent? That's what's happening here, but to an even greater extent, why would a shepherd lay down his life for his sheep? The shepherd's life is much more valuable than the sheep's life. The only answer is because he loves them. No other leader in Israel's history had done that. In fact, the Old Testament leader who served as a model for what a shepherd was like was King David. And for a lot of David's life, for a lot of his reign, he was a great shepherd to Israel. Psalm 79 tells us that. But then there was that incident where David took Bathsheba, the wife of one of his most loyal soldiers, and he slept with her. And when she got pregnant to cover up his own sin and failure, David stages an accident where his loyal soldier dies so that David can take Bathsheba as his own wife and nobody's the wiser. And you get to the end of, of the story and you're left scratching your head saying, David, the great shepherd of Israel makes one of his men die as a cover for his sin. The Jewish people love David. He was the epitome of a great king to them, but it is a huge unanswered question from the Old Testament. Even David turned out to be a bad shepherd. And that's because David is not the shepherd that Israel was yearning for. But see here in John 10, here you've got Jesus who's gonna end his time on earth, not by making one of his people die for his sin, but by him voluntarily dying for theirs. That's what we mean by propitiatory. It means that Jesus took our place in judgment and that's because he's the true shepherd. He's Israel's true king. A true shepherd, Jesus said, lays down his life for his sheep. That is the shepherd that you've always yearned for. Father Maximilian Kolbe was part of the German resistance to the Nazi movement. He'd been public with his objection to the Nazi regime so in 1941, he was sitting at his desk praying when Nazis burst into his home and arrested him for publishing unauthorized material. He was sentenced to the notorious Auschwitz camp. Conditions there, as you know, were harsh. Life expectancy, they say, was about five months. And yet, despite the cold, the heat, the hunger, the grueling labor, Father Colby used every opportunity there to serve his fellow prisoners. One day in the middle of that summer heat, a prisoner from uh, Father Colby's barracks escaped. So in retaliation, the prison guard lined up every prisoner in that barrack and said that 10 of them were gonna be put into the starvation bunker to die as a punishment for this one guy that escaped. And the guard was just gonna choose 10 people at random and he chose the guy standing next to Father Colby and the guy started to weep for his wife and his children. But before he could step forward, Father Colby reached out his hand and stopped him. And he stepped forward in his place. The prison guard looked up and he, he laughed shook his head, but he allowed it. And Father Colby went to the starvation bunker in this guy's place. Several days passed. Prisoners said that, surviving prisoners said that instead of 
the cries of anguish and madness that usually came out of that bunker that they would hear. Instead, during those several days, they heard the faint sounds of hymns that were being sung in that dreadful place. Father Colby brought peace and joy to the other nine in their final moments. They said that when the doors to the bunker were finally open, they found Father Colby's body sitting against a wall with what looked like a peaceful smile on his face. The man whose place he took went on to live until he was 95 years old, died just a few years ago. And for the rest of his life, he took any chance he got to honor Father Colby, the man who had laid down his life for him. There's so much about that story that pictures the gospel, a true shepherd, but there's one big difference. The man that Father Colby replaced had not betrayed or turned on Father Colby personally. And yet Jesus, our shepherd, laid down his life to pay for the sins of the sheep that had rebelled against him. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How do you know the true shepherd? Jesus said to a confused group of Israelites one day, the true shepherd, he said, lays down his life for the sheep. He sees value where others see junk. The leader that they'd always longed for, the leader that you've always longed for. What you've looked for from every leader, every parent, every boss, every president is fulfilled in Jesus. And by the way, for those of you who are in leadership, you're not gonna find a better model of leadership than what you see here in John 10. Christ-like leadership is protective, personal, prospering, and propitiatory. That's another sermon for another day, but it's a great thing for you to jot down and just meditate on. I wanna end our time today with two pictures. Two pictures relating to Jesus as shepherd that I want you to leave thinking about. One's a photo taken just a few years ago. The other is a famous 19th century British painting. Let me tell you about the first picture before I show it to you. Alan Emery was a business leadership guru who spent his early years in the wool industry. He wrote a book called A Turtle on a Fence Post, which I don't know how that has anything to do with the wool industry, but he tells the story of being with a shepherd friend late one night on an open Texas prairie. The shepherd had, ha, ha, the shepherd had lit a ginormous roaring bonfire to keep warm and it sort of marked the center of where the flock should be. And all the sheep were around this fire. Around that bonfire was one shepherd, this guy, three trusty sheep dogs, and a couple thousand sheep. Well, suddenly, this guy says, some coyotes start howling in the distance. Alan said you could feel the entire flock tense with fear. But then Alan said he looked out over the sheep and he saw something he said, I will never forget. So what I saw were thousands of small lights reflecting back at me. Look at it. In their moment of fear, the eyes of the sheep were not looking out into darkness where the predators were. In their moment of fear, they weren't tearing out in panic. They were looking toward their safety. That's where peace and confidence are. What do you do in danger house? I will keep him in perfect peace, God says in Isaiah, whose eyes are fixed upon me. It's not I will keep him in perfect peace who's got that thick 401k that nothing can ever happen. I will keep him who perfect peace whose eyes are fixed on me because he who guards Israel never slumbers or sleeps. He stands guard in front of the door of my pen each night and will not let in anyone or anything that he does not promise to use for good in my life. That means I don't have to be afraid. You wanna know how to find peace when you feel confused or afraid or threatened? You know how to find peace when you don't know what to do with your finances or with one of your kids? When you don't know which direction to go? I will keep him in perfect peace whose eyes are fixed on me. Be anxious for nothing, God tells us in Philippians. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And let the peace, when you do that, the peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. When danger howls, get your eyes onto the shepherd. That's where some of you are this weekend. And so I invite you to look and fix your eyes and rest. Here's the second picture. It's a famous painting, 1898 by Alfred Usher Sword, depicting Jesus, our shepherd, risking his life to go after another lost lamb. See, maybe life has gotten you into a place and you don't, really even know quite how you got here. You're stuck on a rocky cliff out here called addiction. Or you're in a bad relationship. Or you're just suffering under a series of 
bad choices you've made that you now regret. And this morning, maybe for the first time, you realize that your main problem is that you've been doing things your way instead of God's way. You're lost. And it's your sin, it's your insistence on going your own way that has led you to that place. I got good news. The Savior's reaching out for you. He knew you were missing. He left the 90 and 9, he said to go after the one, which was you. That's you and this is him right here, reaching out for you this morning. That's that tug you feel in your heart right now. You've been feeling it for weeks, haven't you? The question is, will you receive him? Will you take his hand? He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to restore you. He wants to put you on a new path, but you gotta surrender to him and you gotta let him have control. Are you willing to do that? All of our campuses, why don't you bow your heads with me if you would. We got two things, two invitations for you. First, with every head bowed, every eye closed, how many of you would say, I am afraid right now. I need to rest in the arms of my shepherd this morning. There's something about life that is terrifying me. Could you just raise your hands and just say, I got something. I'm one of those sheep out there and I hear it howling in the distance. Can you say right now with your hand up, just say in your heart, say, my refuge, my refuge, my protector, my guide. And can you rest in the arms of your shepherd? And put your hands down. Here's the second one. How many of you would say, I'm that lost lamb over on the cliff, separated from God? I've been walking away from God. And right now, I wanna give myself to Jesus and let him rescue me. I'm willing to surrender to him and I'm willing to go back with him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand wherever you are, whether I can see you or not, just raise your hand. I see you, obviously some of you, I can't. You can put your hand down. If that's you, I want you to say right now, if you mean it, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to come home. I receive your offer to save me and I surrender to you. And now I have an invitation. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. Your first act of obedience, showing that you've received Jesus is baptism. Baptism is a public declaration that you're giving yourself to Jesus. It's beautiful imagery. The waters of God's salvation wash over you. You're forgiven of your sin, you're made new. The waters don't have healing powers, of course. They're just a symbol, but it's an important ceremony. So with your heads bowed, there are two groups of you I wanna talk with right now. The first group are those of you who just made a decision today to give your life to Jesus. You raised your hand or you know you should have raised your hand. I wanna invite you to make it public today by getting baptized. Or maybe you got questions about it, that, that, that's fine. I wanna invite you to come forward in a moment and we'll start the conversation with you. And if we need to slow it down and take some time, we will. We'll keep you in the driver's seat. This is your decision, not ours. Maybe you're fully ready today, whatever. In just a moment, when I give you the opportunity, I want you to come. The second group, or those of you who made a decision sometime in the past to receive Jesus, but you have never declared that through baptism. I'm not condemning you for that, but it's time that you took this really important step for yourself. Maybe your parents baptized you when you were a baby. That's great. But baptism is supposed to be your own declaration of faith. If you've trusted Christ, but you've never been baptized of your own choice, I wanna invite you to come also. We got changes of clothes for you. We got everything you'll need. Here's how we're gonna do this. It's pretty standard here at the summit. Our worship teams are coming right now. Our counseling team, our prayer team is getting into place. They're gonna be in the aisles down front at every campus, you'll see them. When I stand you up in a minute, if you need to be baptized or you got questions or you're ready to follow Jesus, whatever, when I stand you up immediately, I want you to step out into that aisle, find the nearest summit representative there in the aisle. Maybe you're nervous to do this, by the way. That's fine, bring your friend with you. They'll come, I'm gonna stand you up and I want you to immediately, don't hesitate, just stand and step. The rest of us are gonna put our hands together and cheer and go crazy with excitement over the step you're taking today, okay? You ready, you ready? Our worship teams are in place. All right, let's stand and as you come right now, just stand and you start to come. Stand up, Summit, let's put our hands together and let's rejoice at what God is doing today. You come right now, wait, come on, there you go, come on.